nature recognizes no boundaries. It put globalization into practice long before the term had ever been phrased. In our modern world, goods, information, and harmful substances spread across the planet at an astounding pace. Organisms have been doing exactly the same thing since the beginning of time. Uncountable species of animals and plants migrate to regions where they had been previously unknown. We can never tell exactly how many are on the move at any given time. Some of these species are purposely transported elsewhere by human beings, whilst others make their own way. Some of the migrants adapt to their new environment without affecting it much. Others bring about strong changes. Delicate, functioning ecosystems are often severely impacted when beasts of prey are involved. This is particularly true in the case of islands. In 2001, quite out of the blue, the mink whose original home is in North America crossed over the Beagle Canal between Argentina and Chile. It made its way to the island of Navarino just off Cape Horn. This was a biological phenomenon, the first terrestrial beast of prey ever to visit this part of the world. Around 100 years ago, thousands of this species of marten were exported from the United States to Argentinian fur farms for their skin. Some escaped and went further down south in search of new hunting territory. Today, the mink has made its way as far as the southernmost tip of the inhabited world. When the species was discovered near Port of Williams, conservation specialists and scientists were alarmed. Elke Schuttler, from the Environmental Research Center Leipzig Halle, is researching the potential spread of this new inhabitant. The governor of the southernmost Chilean province considers her work to be of vital importance. It's an especie que nos enseña. Exotic species like these show us the grave mistake we have made by allowing them to spread unchecked in unspoilt areas. They are dangerous, a huge risk to the local economy and environment. It is imperative to preserve the extremely sensitive and fragile ecosystem of the island world. Elka's research has proved to us that the mink is a top hunter, a first-class predator. Since it arrived on the island, the local bird species have been under constant attack. Using several different methods, the German biologist estimates the present spread of the mink and the real danger it presents for the indigenous wildlife of the island. One of them is trapping. A large percent of her research is aided by the setting of traps at selected spots along coastal areas and rivers. Her work is in cooperation with the German-Chilean cooperation project BioConchil, whose main objective is harmonizing environmental protection and economy on some of the islands known as Tierra del Fuego. The project is financed for the most part by the German Ministry of Research. The results of Elke Schuttler's research are directly linked to the biological control program set up by the Chilean Ministry of Agriculture for Navarino. The mink, whose scientific name is Mustela Vison, is dependent on its proximity to water for its existence. And of course, the biologist knows that although the mink has a varied diet, it is partial to fish. I lay the traps to find out how many minks are living in a certain area. This is how it works. Here is a springboard linked to a mechanism. When the mink sees the fish, it steps onto the board, triggering the door, which then closes like this. A short break at a farm in Guerrico Bay. An important part of Schuttler's thesis consists of interviewing the local population. The fact that local farmers' dogs were the first to discover the arrival of the new troublemaker was one of the first surprises. I set four of my dogs onto one of the minks. The dogs know that if they don't make the first move, the mink will attack them. So they go straight for them and hunt them down, right up to the entrance of their burrow. About a year ago, a mink even attacked a penguin over there, at the coast. The little aggressor actually tried to catch the penguin on the beach. Even for the mink expert, this kind of information is new and comes as a somewhat unpleasant surprise. 
A dead animal will prove useful for the field scientist. She can probably glean a good deal of new information from it. On the move again, Elke Schuttler sets her 20 traps 200 meters apart from one another. As she works, she is always on the lookout for evidence of the mink. Like a detective, she follows every trail, every trace of droppings, every hole. However small the clues are, she notes them down meticulously. This is a mink burrow. I'm checking now to see whether there are any droppings around it, to find out if it's in use. Yes, here we have some. And here, oh yes, there's quite a lot lying around. And this here is quite fresh. You can tell by the gel-like texture. It also has a special minky kind of smell. Later, by examining specimens of the excrement, the detective can gain a fairly good picture of what kind of prey the predator is feeding on at the moment. The droppings are screened for the first time in a provisional laboratory in Porter Williams. This belongs to the Independent Conservation Foundation, or MORA. We can get a pretty good idea of what the animal's been eating by examining its droppings. We sometimes find little bones, feathers, hair. I even found a bird's talon recently, a proper little bird's foot. Then I take the droppings to Magellan University in Punta Arenas. I dry out the droppings and isolate the hair. Then I cross-reference them with the university's collection of skeletons and feathers. Navarino is one of the few remaining places on Earth which is still inhabited by natives, the Yaghan Indians. They lived here as nomadic canoe fishermen for 7,000 years. Nowadays, they have boats with engines. One of their traditional fishing grounds is at Old Coral Bay on the north coast. Today, they are fishing for robalo, a typical inshore fish of the region. The Yaghans know the regions inside out. Their territory stretches as far as Cape Horn. So, of course, the graduate student from Leipzig is eager to talk to them. She especially wants to hear about any encounters they may have had with the mink. I've seen four minks up to now. The last time was not so long ago while I was casting my nets. There was a black one crossing over this bay. They're a real nuisance. They steal chicken and bird's eggs from nests. Only six fish in two nets. A disappointing catch for a whole day's work. Perhaps the mink, which is an excellent diver and loves fish, got here first. Certainly a possibility, although it hasn't been caught in the act as yet. Wow. Out on the field, Elke Schuttler checks her traps on a daily basis. Finding a mink in her trap is no everyday occurrence after all. There's plenty of prey around. And the mink has no natural enemies on Navarino such as the wolf in North America or the Andes jackal in Argentina. After it has been weighed in the trap, the mink has to be lured into a special cage so that it can be examined. The cage can be reduced in size so that the stressed animal can be calmed down and given an injection to put it to sleep. The anaesthetic works for just 10 minutes. During this short space of time, the biologist is under pressure. She has to examine the unconscious animal to find out its age, gender and constitution. She then marks it with an electronic chip so that it can be recognized in future. Right, I'm feeling between the shoulder blades. There's quite a bit of space here under the skin, and that's where I put the needle in. This one has been given the ISO number 4083052. This method of catching and recatching 
gives concrete data on the density of the population. The colour of an animal's teeth and the luster of its coat also allows an assessment of its age and physical condition. The condition of every animal caught is closely monitored. And now your prisoner gets a special treat to help him on his way. Yes, I'm giving him a fish to help him wake up. A fully grown mink is about half a metre long and weighs on average 1,000 grams. A lean machine, all muscle but a glutton nonetheless. Even when in captivity, nothing deters him from his food. After he has eaten, the biologist lets her prisoner go for the time being. Every time he is caught again in the future, he will provide her with valuable new information and insight.